Well, welcome all. Kevin Hart from, from Ariel, which I can never pronounce correctly. So I have to ask <laughs> one more time for the record, how do you pronounce it correctly? Ariel. Yeah, it was okay. Yeah, pretty okay. close. Uh, I get hit in the head a lot. I forget things. So <laughs> we're going to sit and talk a little bit about his company. Please have a seat. And we'll also have questions as we go along. And forgive the boot. It's not a fashion statement. It's just a thing. So tell us first about Ariel. So for everyone who doesn't understand about how you're, you're using augmented reality mm -hmm. to change business and change the way people experience the world around them. Absolutely. So by a show of hands, how many people are familiar with augmented reality? OK, so a good amount. For those of you who don't know, an easy way to think about augmented reality is the yellow line on a football field that's not really there. That's technically augmented reality. It's digital content superimposed over the real world environment and is visible through technology. Well, at Ariel, what we've done to make it unique is we patented and created the ability to place 2D, 3D video and interactive content anywhere in the world instantly so people can walk up around and interact with this interactive content as if it's actually there. And this is all through a mobile device. Now, with that being said, we've also engineered a way to have nearly millimeter level of accuracy with GPS, so you have that absolute level of precision wherever you place content in the world. So we have done a lot of stuff with sports, entertainment, architecture, real estate. So with sports, for instance, if you think about um, like Formula One racing, we can put a broadcast experience to live events. So if you're standing, sitting in the stands, you hold up your phone, you can see the information above the vehicles as they drive around, and the bubbles will, with like their speed, position, who the racer is, will actually move with the content. Or uh, with like the Dallas Mavericks, for instance, we've done scavenger hunts with uh, bobbleheads. We've even 3D scanned the whole team so you can walk up around them, take selfies with them. So there's a lot of different ways that our technology can be applied to sports. But with real estate and architecture, we're able to take the CAD models of structures before they're ever even built, actually anchor them at the location where they'll break ground at scale so you can see the full structure, even walk into it and around it as if it already exists. That's amazing. Um, so it's, you, you've been able to build this all since 2013, correct? That's correct. And right now your team's about eight people? That's correct. And how did you get into doing this? I mean, obviously 2013, the capabilities of people's phones were not very strong right. compared to where they are now. How did you know that the market was going to exist? So that's a really interesting question. I've always been really interested in design. Um, so design was something I've been interested in since middle school when I taught myself uh, the Adobe suite. And so design has always been at my core. And augmented reality is one of these technologies that in 2013 had a lot of potential but still had this negative stigma of being a novelty applied to it. So a novelty meaning that your experience was limited to the dimensions your camera could recognize, because it used a camera to either scan a picture or a QR code, and you get a little 3D model on top of it. So I was trying to figure out how can we remove this limitation from augmented reality. At the same time, I was driving from Dallas to Austin, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen those billboards that say, does advertising work? Just did. And I'm sorry if anybody's in the billboard industry and likes those billboards, but I hate those things with a passion. And because you don't understand impressions, you don't understand conversions, you know nothing about that. Everything's an approximation, and it kind of goes back to the age-old marketing dilemma that half my marketing budget's wasted. The problem is I don't know which half. So I was like, uh, Einstein uses this term called combinatorial play, where it's combining two unlike things to create something entirely new. And so I was like, how can we remove those limitations of augmented reality and make it so we can make it as big as we want, we can put it anywhere in the world, and then how can we take the guessing game on how people interact with brands and have more, better experiences for the most part and able to measure those metrics. So when I first created the company, it was called Airvertise, which is a tough name to digest and even a tougher one to spell. Um, and we were going to be augmented reality advertising and marketing uh, for the real world. And this is where we originally came up with the concept. We filed our provisional, what was then a provisional patent, now full-on patents um, at that time. And then we realized the full potential of what we had and made a pivot. It's fantastic. And um, let's see, from the things that you've been able to experience, how have you been able to convert customers to understand your vision? Because you had some early, you had early customer acquisition that was using you as, on a trial level that helped fund you and right. give you back data. How did you, how were you able to make that, that connection to a company and get them to understand and see your vision and embrace it as part of a business? Right, no, that's a good question. So 
we, we've kind of had this reputation of being like really lean and scrappy. Um, we've had this reputation. We appreciate the references. <laughs> <laughs> Grit, right? There you go. <laughs> um, and so we, we've had this reputation from a really early time in the company because we were very resourceful with our funds and what it is we accomplish. And granted, that means a lot of the team wears a lot of different hats. Um, even still today, on a team of eight, I still wear every hat but engineering. So if that puts things into perspective, I still handle all of our UX, UI, sales, all this kind of stuff. But not to say we're not scaling that out here pretty soon. Uh, but with that being said, we actually reached out on LinkedIn a lot. LinkedIn was a phenomenal tool for us early on where uh, we reached out. And this, this is kind of a pro tip. I'm sure some of you already do this. But if there's somebody you really want to talk to from an organization that you see potential with, don't ask to make a sale. Don't make it seem like it's a blanket message that you're sending out to a lot of people. Make it a genuine letter. And, and what I mean by that is like, Write to figure out more about that person. Be like, I, I like what it is that's on your profile. This particular area interests me. I would love to dive into that more and learn from it, uh, you about it. And when that happens, believe it or not, a lot of people love talking about themselves. And so the more questions you ask, the more they'll want to open up to you. And eventually, you're going to have your opportunity where they're going to say, let me hear a little bit about yourself. And so when they ask you that, now's your time to be genuine, first and foremost, but really talk about what it is your opportunity is and start building that rapport. And once you build that rapport, um, the opportunity to potentially have a sale will come more naturally. That's fantastic. It's great advice. Can you talk a little bit about what got you started in entrepreneurship? Because we, we talked earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And you started when you were really young, and you built a plan, <laughs> and which included working at a major, a major company. Yep, absolutely. To get you to where you are. How did you go about that, and what, what in, enthused you about Yep, so uh, I was originally born in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, blue collar town, mostly formerly steel mills until that moved out. Um, but when my family moved down here from Ohio, we didn't have a whole lot, and I really wanted to go to space camp. And so my parents were like, you have to get a job. Uh, you know, being in fifth grade, I, I couldn't get a job, so I, I had to become an entrepreneur, right? So I started painting people's addresses on their curbs to raise money for space camp. And uh, that was where I perfected an elevator pitch for the first time without knowing it was an elevator pitch. And uh, I actually raised enough to go to space camp, but I never went just because I liked the business side of things more. <laughs> and so uh, maybe there's like control an adult. costs. You learned how to exactly. control costs. It's maybe great. there's like an adult space sell, camp I can go to now. <laughs> I think it's in Russia. Oh, OK, yeah. perfect. <laughs> Um, but I started, it, it, I started doing that in fifth grade, and it kind of carried through. And as I mentioned, I, I taught myself the Adobe Suite in middle school because I love design. And I started a company called Clocks in a Box. And the funny thing about this was I would design uh, faces on wall clocks on Photoshop. And then I would Photoshop them in a clock, Photoshop hands on them, and it looked completely real. I put it up on eBay for about 15 bucks. As soon as somebody bought it, my dad would take me up to Walmart. I'd buy a $3 clock, pop the face out, pop the hands out, print out a face, put it in there, and ship it off. And it was a good quality, but I had no overhead. Uh, my cost of materials was really low, and I had fantastic profit margins. So, How did that scale? Uh, it, it was tough. Uh, it, it was, uh, well, first of all, there was one time I made a Finding Nemo clock, which was a, a big no-no. And I got a nice little cease and desist from Disney. And, and did you frame that? And that's a big. Uh, that's no, a big deal. I, getting I, Disney to contact you. I had you a that. little bit of a meltdown, and uh, my dad actually emailed them back, and was like, "He's just a kid. I wasn't even aware he was doing like this design." And they're like, "Yeah, we re we appreciate entrepreneurs, but let's not do that anymore." And we're like, "Okay, got it." Uh, so I, so I did that for a little bit and continue with the trend of design. Uh, some of my friends, I, I made mock-ups for like funny shirts. I'm like, if you actually get these printed, well, uh, we'll buy them. And so I took my money from clocks. I invested in getting some shirts printed, and I actually sold out of all the shirts. So I went back to the screen printer trying to get more done, and they just didn't want to interact with a young high school kid at this time. And so uh, I was like, you know what? This isn't going to work. Um, I took the money I made from selling the shirts, and I bought all my own screen printing equipment. And I taught myself how to do screen printing. I even built my own exposure unit, all this. And I actually grew that into a pretty good business. Um, I had one parent company and two sub-companies under it. One was called fratprint.com. One was called mercyprint.com. 
same company, but with different target markets and different branding on websites. So one was for churches and charitable organizations. The other one was fraternities and sororities. <laughs> and uh, quite two opposite ends of the spectrum, as some might say. Uh, but it, it was a really good opportunity and showed that we were kind of like the experts in those respective fields. Grew that for a little bit. And that kind of carried me through college. But in college, um, this is kind of a, this is a long story. Sorry, I keep Go going. For it. No, this, uh, is, this is what in, we're here in, for. In college, my, my education was in business, psychology, and neuroscience. And I wanted to take all of those brain sciences and understanding of business and apply it to user experience design and how to actually create behaviors in people through the use of technology. And so coming out of school, um, I knew I wanted to start what Advertise or Arial is now today. So I went ahead and I filed an LLC. I filed a provisional patent for all my IP with like an infinite amount of claims under it. And then I took on a job as the national user experience lead for a consulting company called Sagetti. They're the sister company of Capgemini, where I created UX strategies for multiple Fortune 500 organizations like Boeing, Procter & Gamble, Cintas, GameStop, Pier 1 and several others. Um, they knew there uh, that I was a, a flight risk and that I was going to be leaving after due time. But uh, I, I lived with my parents. I saved every dime possible. And after a year and a half, I made the leap to go full time with Ariel and been doing it ever since. That's fantastic. I mean, that's, that's, a, really, that's a great dedication to knowing when you want to go take some risk and limiting risk by, by really being enthused as to what you want and, and learning the sales aspect. Um, how would you recommend someone else look at themselves to figure out what makes them tick, like the way that you've been able to, to figure out what makes you tick and why you have to do this instead of you know, working at Capgemini, which pays really well and is very stable, yeah. although it requires horrible travel. So, so entrepreneurship, and I'm going to be brutally honest with this, it, it's, it's tough. Um, and you have to be very passionate about what it is you're doing because every single day you're going to wake up and it's never going to be the same. Okay, so if you're planning on a career in consistency, entrepreneurship's not going to give you consistency that you're looking for. As a matter of fact, when we were talking last week, I even told him, like, every day from a, it's a range of emotions. You're never going to just have a good day or a bad day. You're going to have an okay day, great day, horrible day, the worst day of your life, and then it's going to end all right. And then and it changes every single day. There's so many ebbs and flows from it. But it's a matter of being resilient and having the mental strength to really bounce back from a lot of this. And, and when it comes to uh, working for a large company like I did in the past, one of the things that, not knocking them, but one of the things that really helped push me over the edge was I could not accept complacency. And being in an environment where everybody is OK with the status quo, everybody's OK at the 9 to 5 checking out, and nobody has, a, not nobody, but a lot of people don't have a growth mindset, really hurt. Because you know, every day, and I, I think about it from a career standpoint, I, I work every day because I want to provide for my family like the way my family provided for me. And I want to even take that next step further. And so you got to have that hunger. you got to have that drive. And that means not always clocking out at 5 o'clock. That means figuring out a way to differentiate yourself from everyone else. Uh, like one of the things we were talking about last week is that I, like, I used to hate reading growing up. And then I learned the value of what books could have. And so I, I made it a New Year's resolution one year that I was going to master the knowledge from 20 different books on experts in the field that I wanted to be a part of. And that's not just read to know it, read to understand it. That is read to truly master that knowledge. Because as a 21-year-old kid, if I master the knowledge from 20 different books, that's my differentiator from my peers. And so it's really critical to understand that value reading and have that growth mindset because you really need that as an entrepreneur. Oh, and I also heard a quote recently that I think is applicable to that. It says, not all readers lead, but all leaders read. And I think that is spot on to becoming an entrepreneur. How have your peers been with you like this? Because I would imagine, especially your generation, we make fun of. Um, Gen X, we make fun of your, your generation. <laughs> Get over it, because every gen, 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 the generation before mine made fun of us as right. well. So get over it. It happens. How do you deal with being different within your generation and being able to have this single, this incredible focus and ability to be driven and recruit talent in that is able to meet your, your need for people to be driven, but also be able to be the employee versus being the leader of the, of the team? Right. Now, I think that's a really good question. And every time we 
go to hire somebody, we interview somebody. The one point that I, I always ask them, and it kind of puts people on their heels a little bit, is that we don't accept no as an answer, okay? Not that we're looking for yes men, but if we have a goal that we're trying to achieve and the technology that hasn't been created and we have the opportunity to do so, we're not gonna accept that can't be done or we're not able to do it yet or, hey, isn't Apple or Google gonna do that one day? Like, that's an excuse. And we don't accept excuses because that's an opportunity for us to succeed. That's an opportunity for us to carve out our own market. And by just writing it off like we can't do that or somebody else is going to do it, we might as well just give it away. And so as long as you have that growth mindset and you, can't, and you can say yet at, a lot of end, at the end of a lot of things, like we can't do that yet, but we're going to figure out how, that's culturally what we're looking for in our business. And it seems to work out pretty well for us today. And with that, we had some churn early on. We learned from a lot of people that we were with, and it's okay to do that. It's, it's, you probably heard the term, fail forward, and, and you're going to be doing that when you go through some of these early employees, but you know, it, it sharpens you as a person and you as a company, and you're going to get the right people when you do things like that. How, how have you been able to learn to let go of, as you said, you had to give up one part of the company, mm -hmm. and I, you told me we talked earlier last week, and that seemed like that was a big thing for you to let go because that's what you built your initial skill set on. Yep, absolutely. How did you learn to let go of that? And what do you still think you need to, to do as, you know, as part of your next 20 books for 2019 to get to, uh, to the next stage? I mean, I, uh, I talk to Jax about this every other week. And I, it's literally a constant challenge for me to let go of things. I was the guy that growing up with my own companies, I did everything, especially with the shirts. Like, I, I would wash out the screens, I'd do the screens, I would do the artwork, I'd print the shirts, I would sweat on those shirts. When they say blood, sweat, and tears, it's kind of gross what some of those shirts had on them that people are wearing. But uh, uh, I mean, I delivered them, I, I did everything. So I'm used to wearing a lot of hats. When I did the school projects in school, I was the guy who was like, hey, go ahead and let me do it because I knew the quality was gonna be all right and I knew I could support my grade. But that's not always the best mentality. We got to a certain kind of point in our company where I realized I have to let go of these things. And it's tough. I said I still do UX UI because I love doing that stuff, but I know eventually I'm going to have to let that go. And that's going to have to be, unfortunately, probably sooner than later. But I guess that's a, a, a good problem to have. Unless but, you get a black turtleneck. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but the big thing is, is I realized I was becoming a bottleneck. I was stifling the growth of our company by trying to hold on to too many of the hats, trying to hold on to so much responsibility. And then I realized that I hired the people to give me the feedback we need from a company and from a technology standpoint, and I need to trust them in doing their job. And so that's what we've done. I'm still, uh, when it comes to the technology, I say that I can, uh, I, I talk the talk, but not walk the walk. And so it's enough to be able to have that conversation. I think it's important for everybody to have that. But at the end of the day, I let them do their job, especially when it comes to writing code. Because it takes special people to write code. Yes, so I've heard. I'm yeah. not one of those. Um, what are the, you've mentioned the books a few times. What are the books that have had the largest impact on you? And maybe it's your business, but it's also your ability to, to be who you are and be happy with how you succeeded with that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's several books, and, there, and there's a couple experiences that I know we talked about, too. So uh, one of the greatest books, there's a few great books, actually. So one is Pitch Anything by Orrin Claff. Um, it tells you not only how to talk, how to present, how to overcome some of the things that it takes to stand up on stage and do some of these things, but it also talks to you about how to present to an, um, a frame, okay? So what they mean by a frame is that I see the world through my perspective, my frame, you see it through yours, and same with everybody else here. But when I pitch you, I want to pitch it so that it makes sense through your frame. And they talk about identify the different frames, how to deal with different people, like if you have somebody who's like a power frame, for instance, like somebody walks in and says, we have an hour long meeting scheduled, they say I only have 30 minutes, and you say great, well I only got 20 minutes, so this works out perfectly. It's all about a shift of power and how to handle things. So that's just an example on some of the tips it gives there. The other uh, book that I heavily recommend is uh, Hooked by Nir Eyal. And so um, that's how to, it goes back to habit forming technology and references a lot of the work of B.J. Fogg, who's the founder of the Institute of Persuasive Technology at Stanford. Um, and he's also coined the term captology, which is computer application of persuasive technology, but how to form positive habits in people through the use of mobile devices, computers, and some of the other technologies we use today.
That's fantastic. A little bit, little bit more, um, what do you see as being the, the driving force for your industry going forward? How do you think it's going to change? And what do you think are the inflection points that are going to make everyone go, you're going to have a, a huge amount of people wanting to compete with you because of X, Y, or Z. Like Pokemon Go might be a good example because that, that's really one of the first commercial uses of, of what you do that, I've, that I saw. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to say Pokemon Go is a glorified sticker. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a fun, but sometimes no, stickers just, sell. I, no, I'm just messing with you. I, I say that because you can't walk up around it. It's just no. set to a direction. You can get in a car, drive 20 but miles away. But they made tons of money with right doing something that was really dumb. Absolutely. No, I agree with you. No, it, it, it's a good uh, starting point. But I think the, the big thing is when people start to understand the value of what augmented reality has. And granted, there's a lot of barriers being broken down, and the technology has had a lot of iterations from being just this image recognition to using infrared, but you can't use infrared outdoor. AR kit and AR core are really great because it's markerless, but you still have to scan an environment in order for it to work. So technology is kind of getting there. But the big thing that helps augmented reality grow is education. You won't believe how many times I still sit down with a lot of people and they say they're interested in augmented reality, but they get it confused with virtual reality, and that we have to go through this a lot. So it's still really early on in its infancy as an industry, but still has a lot of potential for growth. And that's where we're really trying to identify those use cases on how the technology can be applied from, especially like a utility standpoint. Mm -hmm. And to give you an example of that, we've worked with some local cities. We've even worked with large corporations on the IoT side of things where we can take in GIS data, which is geographical information systems, where you understand where pipes are in the ground, like your water, sewage, electricity, gas. And instead of having a field worker out there with a computer trying to figure out where these pipes might be in the ground, we can actually accurately place those with augmented reality so a field worker can just hold their device and look down and see the pipes in the ground, almost like an x-ray view. Right. And so when you think about use cases like that that truly solve a problem, which is the key there, and it's not a novelty, that's what really will help augmented reality grow and hit that next inflection point. And how, is, how are you creating the, the center for augmented reality in the North Texas region versus on the West Coast. Oh, absolutely. That must be really challenging because it's not, you would think that's a West Coast type of thing. Yes, uh, you would think that, and a lot of the big companies are out there too, but you know, one of the talks we had is when, it, especially when it comes to investment, we, we've had the offers to go out there and you have to fire the whole team, move out here, hire people from Stanford, and it's, it's, it's crazy. It's not necessary. We don't want to be the company moving out while everybody else is moving in. And that's one of the big things. The other part about why we keep it here is the level of talent here, I think, is on par, if not better, than it is on either the coast, too. And being centrally located, it's great. You know, when we first started out, there was this big push. You need to be on the West Coast. You need to be on the East Coast. But luckily, people are finding the value of being centrally located. And we also live in a time where I don't have to be everywhere. I don't have to be in person at every meeting. You know, if you want to see a demo, especially with our technology, give us your address, and I'll put it there. You can launch the app and go out and look at it yourself. So it's not always necessary to be there. So being in Dallas doesn't hamper us at all from a company perspective and then obviously gives us the opportunity to grow with having substantially lower burn rates and a great amount of talent here as well. That's fantastic. What do, what do you think are the resources we need to build here to have more companies like yours? Maybe it's training people to get the experience that you had as a kid to be able to build their career and realize that they can do it here versus having to move to the Bay Area. Yeah, absolutely. So there, there's a couple different angles I think this could be applied from both an entrepreneurial perspective as well as an investment perspective. Uh, I think it's good for kids to understand entrepreneurship from a really early age. I think Shark, I, I say this reluctantly, I think Shark Tank is really good to expose people, get them excited about starting a business, kids seeing kind of the fundamentals of what, going, what goes on, but there needs to be a level of realism that that's not how an investment talks really go. You don't walk in, you don't pitch for five minutes and walk out with a half a million dollars. Um, that, that usually takes a really long time. So managing expectations. But I think it's also good to get kids integrated into understanding entrepreneurship from a really young age, even outside of a lemonade stand. Because that's what's going to help. I go back to the differentiators versus your peers. That's what's going to help you grow as a person, grow in business, whether you ultimately become an entrepreneur or not, 
there are certain fundamentals that aren't taught in school that you have to have real world experience doing. And the earlier you can get exposed to those, the better. Um, and then from an investment standpoint, especially being here in Frisco, I think there needs to be some kind of level of education about what it takes to be an investor. You know, living in a, an area that's relatively affluent, I think there's people that are, can qualify as accredited investors without understanding the qualifications that go into be doing that. Um, so if there is an education standpoint, not only from the entrepreneurship perspective, getting people um, involved early on, much like this program is doing here tonight, but also getting people who could be potential investors, understanding the value and what it takes to do so, I think would be tremendously valuable as well. That's fantastic. Thank you. We, and again, we, we want more of that feedback and keep on letting us know. I thought we would open it up for some questions for the group. Yes, please. Um, I'm sure there's everyone, a lot of people have some questions. I know uh, Danny does as well. You had mentioned early on that you had gotten a patent and uh, having received several through companies that I worked for, they said that each patent that I applied for cost $30,000 or mm -hmm. something of that nature. So I'm interested in how you funded and got your first patent. Uh, that's a good question related to how we got our first patent. So we first started out by filing a provisional patent. Uh, with a provisional patent, you pretty much have a year to get the full patent, like find the money to do so. Um, and so a provisional patent substantially cheaper. It gives you the value of um, uh, the filing date, but it's not something that's enforceable by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so what we did really early on is we, we never did a deal for free. Um, we held out to make sure that any deal we do generates revenue and really sold the value of our company from early on and made several internal proofs of concept to help do that. Like our very first deal, we did Shark Week for the Discovery Channel. And it was a pretty significant deal. Luckily, it came at a time that I could allocate some of those funds towards our patents, as well as uh, some of the money that I had saved up personally from taking the job before I went full time with this. We were able to allocate those. But the thing is, is that $30,000 you're talking about, that's not all in one big punch. You know, it comes through time between you know, the fees you have to pay to the government, plus your attorneys for all the office action responses. It's a process that adds up over time. And it's not always a definitive line at 30. Depends on which firm you work with. Some of them set a, a hard price to it, but a lot of it's hourly and can be less or it could be more. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. So, uh, Kevin, thank you for being here. I really appreciate your uh, insight into business and technology. My question is, uh, in these engineering and technology fields, we do focus a lot on the hard skills of uh, mathematics, uh, engineering, uh, coding, things like that. What role does ideation and creativity play in the equation for you? Do you quantify that? Do you look for certain skills and really try to uh, develop those as you do with the hard skills as well? Yeah, absolutely. So the tough thing for me to say right now is I still handle all the ideation and creativity. So we, we haven't fully hired somebody from that aspect, but when it comes to the engineering standpoint, it takes a level of creativity from that as well and how you actually go about solving these problems. And the best thing is with engineers in a small company too, we give them the sense of uh, figuring out the problems themselves, providing us what the solution is, and then we determine whether or not they should execute that, and that helps give them a sense of ownership. As far as ideation, I literally still handle every single ideation session with every single client we have. And one of the big things we do, and it goes back to the whole captology or hook from near y'all, is what I do is I go in, I sit down across them and say, what behaviors do you want to create in your users? And then once they tell me what those behaviors are, we essentially use the hook model, reverse engineer what those experiences would be, create five or six of them, provide them back to the client in an a la carte style, and allow them to select which ones they want. We'll develop them, deploy them, and then provide them back to them. So hope that answers your question. Great. Thank you. Some more questions? So, what about the hardware side, like the device? Phone based or talking about the live on the WD sign and just trying to make sure you have that stuff? We are phone based, okay? So, we're on mobile devices. Uh, the highly accurate portion of our technology is backward compatible on devices to almost four years old now. Um, we have a less accurate version for devices a little older than that, as, which ranges within like about a meter to two meters of accuracy. So still pretty accurate in the grand scheme of things. 
Um, as far as wearable technology goes, in my honest opinion, I think it still has got a ways to go, okay? Um, there is a, a couple of devices out there from companies like ODG, which is Osterhout Design Group, which is like a military grade wearable that nobody's really gonna wanna wear, but it's probably one of the better ones out there today. And I think it's a little ridiculous that companies like Magic Leap have raised over $2 billion and have put out a product that, oh, even more now, um, that have put out a product that's on par with some of the other ones that are out there today. So um, a lot of these technologies don't work outside because they are infrared sensor based. A lot of them don't have GPS built in in any capacity. The best connectivity you can get is to Bluetooth back to your device to help send signals or you have to have it corded and wear this big thing on your hip because you can't put it in your pocket because it'll start a fire. So not anything that's really good to bring out to market. <laughs> Fires are bad? Yeah, not good. Okay. <laughs> I want to check that. Just my opinion. We should put that down, right? Someone should write that down somewhere. Kevin, I had a question for oh, you. Yes. So I'm in real estate, commercial real estate specifically. You mentioned you're working with buildings to um, design what the building would look like. Are you working with any real estate companies to um, provide clients what a floor plan would look like? So, so if somebody were to provide you like a program, um, or the CAD file for that, would you guys be able to kind of map out what it would look like if they had space needs? It's funny you should bring that up because that's actually, we're right on the brink of wanting to enter into that space. So our technology does support the CAD model. So I was actually talking to the gentleman right behind you earlier today about it. And uh, what we can do is like for a new development here in Frisco, say for instance, they put up two model homes, but there's eight other models that haven't been built yet. What we can do is take the CAD model of those structures, allow a user to pick out the lot they want to put it on, put it there, see it at scale, and walk into it. And then we could take the design center, plug it in on our back end so they can customize it as they walk through that house. We even allow them to go to the second floor, not because we figured out how to walk on augmented stairs, but we can move the, the upper level down to the ground level. And then we can take all those customization features, tie it back into a CRM so the builder knows exactly who's interacting with what content, where, how long, and then also what customization features they have. Another value proposition of our technology is that we measure over 70 different metrics in real time. They're related to human behavior, engagement, and geo-intelligence. So we measure all the standard conversion, impression, all of that data you can think of. Plus, from the geospatial standpoint, we understand from like a heat map perspective where the most activity is occurring, how people are interacting with that content, down to even what speed are they moving at. Are they walking, jogging, a passenger in the car? That way somebody can contextually update that experience for the ideal audience. You're a very good speaker. I was wondering if you oh, took you. any speech classes or went to Toastmasters or you just kind of learned as you Or went. you learned it by pitching yeah. since you were 12. Learned yeah. By <laughs> uh, no, thank you. I appreciate that. I actually, um, I've always been fascinated by the pitch. Early on, I really actually didn't like ever getting up in front of a lot of people. I, I think a lot of people feel that way. And so it just comes with practice. Um, there was, I mean, I studied the books of like the presentation skills of Steve Jobs and, and things like that. And there, there's certainly little tips and tricks that take time uh, to actually understand. But also, a lot of people say, you know, film yourself, watch how you're doing. That's, that's kind of awkward sometimes. And like, I'll probably go back and watch this footage and be like, oh, I hate how I did this or that. So it's easy to be critical of yourself. But really look at other people who speak. You, know, you probably watch TED videos and you can go back and watch how... Steve Jobs did present, and there's certain things about body language and how they have different voice inflections that really help get a point across and gather the attention of their audience. Thank you. Thank you. One more? Here you go. So the question is, what do you see as driving the consumer adoption of augmented reality? Um, for all the potential, I, I, I kind of live on the edge of tech, and I still don't see it. I'm not exposed to it that much. So I'm wondering what's going to get right. everybody in this room to start using AR. So there's a couple things. It, it goes back to like solving the problem, especially with like sports and entertainment. The big thing I, I even I think I mentioned it earlier is how we convert the broadcast experience into live events. So so many people, for instance, are saying, oh, I can stay at home. I get a better experience. I get to watch in the comfort of my own home. 
But there's something about being in that environment and having value. But there's still things on TV that are really cool, like those graphics. So how can we bring that to an event where people mostly use their device from a distraction from the world around them and change that behavior to the enabler of those new experiences? Something that uses the device to accentuate the experience as opposed to distract it. Now, the reason you're probably not getting exposed to that is there's not a lot of other technologies that do it. And I'm not trying to toot our own horn here. But when it comes to that, a lot of them really have those limitations that don't allow you to have those experiences at scale. Like for instance, there's one other company that's, uh, I would say, probably our closest competitor, and they do a lot of stuff in baseball. But you have to recognize the foul poles in order to see an experience. If the foul pole goes out of range, you lose your experience. So there's a lot of limitations around what that technology can have. And it also is limited based off of like network capabilities and, some, and connectivity. Um, so as long as you remove a lot of those limitations, those barriers, and you open it up to things that solve problems or accentuate an experience, I think it will increase consumer adoption. The big thing also that I always preach, especially from an early time in our company, is that when, and this is, if I'm going too deep on this one, stop me, but Go for it. from a neuroscience perspective, when you have pattern disruptions of an environment you're already familiar with, it hits a part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens, which releases dopamine. Dopamine makes us happy. So how can we constantly change the pattern of the environment you're already familiar with by introducing new experiences for you to engage with? And when you hit that level of interaction with people where something's always different in that environment, then we'll have much higher adoption rates. And then I think there's one other point to that. And by the way, Disney's been doing that for forever at their amusement parks. Oh yeah, absolutely. They were, they, they, yes. And the other thing with augmented reality, and, and we're working to solve this problem, and the solution will ideally come out in Q2 of 2019, is that people can't create the content and deploy it themselves. Okay, everybody has to know a game engineer, a software engineer, somebody to create these AR experiences and deploy it for them. With us, we're gonna be releasing a content management system that will allow both developers and non-developers the ability to create, deploy, and manage their own AR experience without ever writing a line of code. And so this will allow us to hit scale. People put their, eye, their imagination into reality, and I'll open up a lot of doors for others to interact with it. It sounds like then it's almost, it's almost like we, it's almost the confluence of eSports where now the athletes are being interviewed while they're playing, which is different than a normal, than traditional sports. Absolutely. But now you could have people watching, watching on a Twitch channel or a YouTube channel, any game, soccer, cycling, Formula One, and I could be creating my content about why it matters, look for this person to pass on the last lap. That's right, absolutely. So that could be a really interesting user interface. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're, you're offering the tech that's hopefully the breakthrough. Yeah, and it, we'll certainly have a few things that'll make recommendations on how to create those experiences. Fantastic, I think we have one more question. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Pete. How are you doing? Pretty good on yourself. I'm good. Hey, um, Microsoft just sold 100,000 AR lenses to the Department of Defense. How do you see that being impactful in breaking through the, uh, the glass ceiling of AR adoption? I think it, it's, it's a good way to show there's a little bit of interest in the wearable space, um, but I don't think it's, it's completely scalable from a wearable uh, perspective yet. I think those, that technology is going to be used a lot for training purposes, but it validates the industry. Okay, And with that being said, it, you know, augmented reality isn't just software, it's not just hardware, it's both. If I told you how big the AR market's going to be, um, it, it includes both software and hardware. I, I think it's good, but um, I think it'll help the industry grow and open the eyes of a lot of people because the government's backing it. Um, but I still think the actual hardware component of it has a long way to go. We got one more. We got one more, Bruce. Yeah. When you talk about It, it is a challenge, um, and there's not an easy answer for that either. And hopefully, that answer will more go more venture capital firms based in the region. I think that's the answer. Yeah, I, hopefully that answer gets a little bit easier over time. Um, but it's just a matter of of being persistent and identifying the right people. So when it comes to raising funds for us and what we were able to gather uh, early on, it was more from an angel perspective or a small family office perspective. It's, it wasn't from like a big VC organization. So the big thing is, is when you're um, dealing with West Coast VCs, for instance, it's not always about revenue. It's always about like IP or 
uh, the big idea and some of this stuff. And that, that's why they kind of had the bubble for a while there. Um, but with here, revenue is very important. And so you got to make sure you have a little bit of traction if you're wanting to get some capital from a VC here that really validates not only your company, but you as a CEO. That's great. Any more questions? I can't thank everyone. In, help me uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the I opportunity. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. It's been a great talk. <laughs>